Welcome everybody to the October 1st, 2020 edition of In the Interim. I'm Bruce Mueller, Intern Dean at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy, and I'm so happy to welcome uh, my guest, Dr. Tim Cernak. Uh, Tim is an assistant professor of medicinal chemistry, and uh, I wanted to have him on because um, he's been on the news a lot lately, and I wanted to have him talk about some of the work that he's been, been working on with his group. And so I, with that, I want to welcome Tim. Welcome to, to uh, In the Interim. Now, generally, people have a fancy background behind them, but not you. Are, no. Are we, where are we? Uh, we are, I'm in the upstairs bedroom. Um, this is uh, the best chance that I have to not have a four-year-old come and uh, scream at me. And it's with all of you collectively saying, you know, that you need to come do this with me now. So um, I can hide up here usually and, uh, and, and do these kinds of things. It's, a, it's amazing where everybody's, I've, people, I've talked to people they are in closets, they're in their basement, they're in their third bedroom. Sometimes they can't get away from the four-year-old who just runs through the screen and that might happen tonight and that's okay if that's what happens. Yeah. So I, I wanted, to, wanted to say a little bit about your background here. Uh, when when I looked at it, I, I thought, my goodness, okay, born in Montreal, Canada, but you get your bachelor's all the way across to British Columbia uh, and in, in bachelor's of science in, in chemistry. But then this is what stopped me. You studied the aroma profile of Chardonnay wines. Okay, I would have stopped right there, but give, give us, I don't know if you're a wine person, but give us something about the aroma profile of Chardonnay wines, please. I'd be very happy to. Um, and I mean, you know, it's uh, maybe things are coming full circle. We're we're actually tinkering in. Well, we're, I'm always tinkering in Chardonnay wines, uh, <laughs> personal perspective, I guess. Uh, but uh, no, so this. Uh, I mean, it really maybe for for those of you who are students on the call, like this was a case of uh, of trying to find research that I could do in the space that I was at. I mean. Uh, before that experience, actually, I'll, I'll say that um, I, I, I went to a really, really small school. There was like 120 people in, in our graduating class covering chemistry, nursing, English, everything. Like 120 of us were all the graduating class. I think we're like six chemists. And so, so there were like no job opportunities in the small little town I was in. And, uh, and, and so I went to like the job board, right, for like the, you know, like here's what you could do with your summer. And the one experience that was there was to go work in a gold mine as a king and I um and I said okay well it's the one so I'll go do that and so I went and did that and I worked in a gold mine uh as a chemist uh digging for I mean I I wasn't actually in the mine I was in a lab up above the mine and, and they would send up rock samples and we'd grind them up and find out how much gold was in there uh and it, I mean it, it was terrible it was like what like I mean like what so it was um if you go to like the upper peninsula here and then if you went like 300 miles straight up from there that's where this place was uh there was like there were the like kids had to learn to drive by going like driving one hour so they could get to a four-way stop so they could practice what a four-way stop sign was um, but there was like no red lights or green lights all right what city was this in so we can look it up later and, and you know, tell us red lake or someplace way 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 up. it's called a manitou watch uh, which, uh, which was an old uh, native name meaning cave of the great spirit was the nice way that they said it. But then, but then they, they said that it, it like, it's called like devil's hell hole or something is what the locals. <laughs> and that's what the job was like, apparently. All right. So, so yes. Yeah, so I spent, I spent six months there as a, I had just finished organic chemistry and I was like, I want to get a job because I want to do research and I want to, you know, I want to have a career. So I want to like learn how to do things. I'll go to the job board because I don't know what else to do. And there was one job. So I took it. And I got into it and I, I was like up in the middle of like, you know, practically Arctic Canada. It was terrible. And I thought, I, I can't do this again. I like, what else will I do? I need to, I need to plan this out better. So as soon as I got back home, all the way to the Western side of Canada. So kind of like just North of uh, Spokane, Washington, if, if you know the West at all. Um, uh, I, I, I started talking to my professors and saying like, Hey, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't drive to the Arctic and like, dig through rocks looking for gold as much as I learned in that experience um I need to I need to do something else and there was one guy uh on my campus one of our organic chemistry professors who was uh, be he was becoming emeritus when it, we started talking but he had an interest in wines in Chardonnay wines and he and he, he said well hey I'm looking for someone uh to you know to work on this project 
and uh, and so I got to work with him on this. And so, uh, so I mean, the town that I come from, wine is a main industry. Uh, wine, wine, and and skiing are are, uh, are a major industry. So it's kind of like a fun uh, place to retire to. It was terrible as a teenager, but um, but now now it's romantic to go back to. So I got to work on wines. Uh, and so basically, what we did was we tried to extract them. Uh, like we would, so we um, we would extract them. Uh, with these like little like cartridge things, uh, you you would like hover it above the glass of wine or whatever, and then we would inject that into a uh, a mass spectrometer, and you would get like a fingerprint. You get like twenty different uh, volatile compounds that you know some smelled like lavender, some smelled like uh, I don't know uh, uh, mint or whatever, um, and um, and then uh, and, and then yeah, we got the data from that. But the fun, so the funny, the, the, the thing that cracks me up about this is like I you know I I, I learned about Chardonnay and and I, you know I started like enjoying wines um, at the la last year of my undergrad, but um, I. Uh, I was I was doing this in collaboration with a professor. So my professor who was helping me do this was an organic chemistry guy. And, and so, you know, we kind of talked about the molecules, but then we collaborated with someone in geoscience who was doing, he was like hungry for the data that we were generating. And so we would send him these like fingerprints, right? So I would I would uh, drive to wineries, get the wine, do this extraction thing, um, and, and then and then analyze it. And then and then we he would get the data that was like these 20 volatile compounds we we're looking at. And he would uh, analyze it, and he'd come back, and and this was kind of like I, I didn't understand it at all. He took like he's like I put this into the, something called a principal component of analysis, and I'm like, okay, I, I don't know what that is. Um, if any of my students are on the call, they might be laughing because I teach this now. It's like very like germane to my current research, uh, but this is I don't know maybe 20 years ago that I used this thing. I had no idea what it was, and so what he could do with this principal component analysis is take the concentrations of these 20 different wine volatiles. And he can say he would he would say, okay, you gave me twenty different uh, wine samples. You got these three wines from this winery. You got these four wines from this winery. And these five wines actually come from this winery, but two of them were grown in the northern part of the of the uh, the state, and three of them were grown in the southern part. And they I was could like, tell that from the fingerprints. Yeah, 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 from from like twenty volatile compounds like uh, limonene and. Carbone and, and linalool and stuff like this, just um, like a simple organic compounds. They have different concentrations, and it, and it. So I mean, these things are like the main things that that contribute to the bouquet of a wine, and um, and then uh, uh, they you know the, the concentrations of them are dependent both on the grape, which kind of is determined by the soil and the you know the growing conditions. So you can kind of determine where in this this wine growing valley that we live in. Uh, they were coming from, and then as well, they get influenced by the yeast and, uh, and processes that the, that the vintners use. Uh, and so, um, so, so anyway, so then, then I was like, you know, it actually wasn't until I came here that, um, that Jane Mitchell informed me that I had published this paper that when I was preparing my first grant here, Jane Mitchell is, is, helps us write our grants. Uh, if, if probably a lot of people on the call, uh, maybe you haven't interacted with Jan, but she's probably helped out your career in some way and you didn't know about it. Um, but anyway, so when we were preparing my first grant uh, proposal, she was like, I extracted all your publications. And, and I was like, wait, I published this? Like I have a Chardonnay publication? I knew we gave posters on it and stuff, but it's in, it's in a super obscure journal called Geosciences Canada, which the University of Michigan does not have a license to. I subscribe and, uh, to my house though. I, I get the paper copy every, every month, yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so that was um, that was one of the things that, that happened. That's maybe more than I've ever talked about my undergraduate experience. <laughs> it's, uh, it's but it's but it's fabulous. So uh, a couple things uh, jumped in my mind. The, the first is we have students, uh, uh, as you said, and if anybody wants to ask a question, just use the question and answer feature, and I'll, I'll work the question in. Also, at, when we're done here, you can ask questions live as well. So either way, whatever you're comfortable doing, we'll do that. But I guess one of the things I wanted to say from a career perspective with all these students on is. Um, sometimes it's good to get a crappy job and to learn what you don't want to do. And you, you had it working in the gold mine. I think that was a song, but <laughs> uh, you know, say, same with me, you know, uh, a lot of times I have students come in and go, I don't know, you know, I hate this particular rotation. Well, why do you hate it? What's, what's bad about it? What can you learn from it? Cause there's still things you can learn from it. Um, you know, talk to me about these bad jobs and, and how did that direct you? Cause you went from there and you did something totally different. Yeah, that is, so I think that that's a that's a um, a really uh, great way to, to to segue out of this. That um, that 
like you never know the skills that you're learning today and the people that you're meeting today, what they're going to mean to you five years down the line or 10 years down the line. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm teaching a, a medicinal chemistry class right now, and I'm really trying to impress this upon my students that like there's there's so much that we're covering, but it's, you know, like there's a lot of what we're what we're touching on now that is going to be hopefully important to you 20 years down the line, but you won't know it until until then. And so while there was like, you know, so many aspects of these of these uh, experiences that uh, that were a struggle while I was going through them, uh, I, I think it, it really, you know, kind of added to my my overall just base of knowledge and, and things that I knew and, and, and really, uh, you know, really kind of helps out. Um, I mean, one thing was like I with it with the gold mine thing. I was just like continually weighing out the exact same amount of rock to fifteen point zero 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 grams. I'd do that like every morning. We'd get these. You know something. how to party? Yeah, sounds like uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was good stuff. But uh, but then when I got to grad school, I was and and all through my I, I spent um, I, I don't even know we're eleven minutes in. I don't know if I'll get to even talk about how I once had a career in industry and, and now I yeah, I, I want to get there sometime but these but this is too good to pass up I, I was super super good at weighing stuff right I mean like like the whole time I was behind this balance I was like this stinks this is stupid what a waste of my you know my skills and then uh then I um you know then when I got to grad school like I could hit like five milligrams on the nose um really quickly what a skill there's a skill brain. right there Right, right, right. I, I hope one of my students are on the call because then I'm gonna be like, "You can come weigh out our screens for us." Oh man! But so, all right. Well, yeah, let's so, fast forward. You you get you get your PhD from McGill. Then you you do a, a fellowship at Columbia, and then you do. I mean, you're you're the ultimate good person for our our students to talk to. who are trying to think about what to do with their career because you go in the industry. You don't start in academia. Yeah. That's not I don't typical. So let's talk about why why there and why not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, so um, you know, I, I had I had no aspiration to go to academia when when I was when I was going through it. It was always about uh, I was I was so focused on drug discovery and and working in the pharmaceutical industry. There was I, so um, I I went back to Montreal to do my PhD and and I think that. I wonder if there's like a good networking spin here. Like, like you, you guys are in such good shape coming from the University of Michigan. The people that you have the opportunity to meet, and and, and hopefully I'll get a talk, a chance to talk about this. The number of times that like that I got to, I got to, uh, uh, just, you know, have my career accelerated just a little tiny bit these days because I said I'm from Michigan, like the number of times that I'm out there, like on the road or whatever, and people are like, oh, hey, like, you know, you're you're from Michigan? I, yeah, go blue, I was there in, you know, 98 or whatever. And, and like, this happens really, really frequently. Um, and I have, I, have a, I have a good story, I hope I get a chance to tell by the end of this, um, about getting a, uh, a, 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 a very expensive robot for, for a dollar. Um, on account can we, you can tell a story because any robot for a dollar is worth telling that story. Uh, we'll, hopefully we'll come back to it. So so in Montreal, there was a pharmaceutical industry, you know, like you guys are here in Ann Arbor now. And, and sadly, the industry in Ann Arbor is not what it once was. There's, there's a biotech community, but it, like it's not it's not what it was when when Pfizer was here. Right. Um, but, you know, one thing that is darn clear is that the pharmaceutical industry is, is heavily invested in in the University of Michigan. Like they're they are. They're eager to uh, to meet students from from, from this uh, from this college from this university, and they actively recruit here. Which I mean, you know, I, I hope all of those on on the line uh, can can appreciate like the how blessed you are to have this experience. Because at McGill, we we didn't really have that. Like there was there was there was a little bit of industry. I got to meet some people, enough people that I was like, I really want to do that. Um, but uh, but here at, at Michigan, I think you know the, just the quality of science that happens here. It, it makes it natural that that, that companies are going to look to this school and say, yeah, we, that's where we want to recruit talent from. Um, and so um, so yeah, so then so I, I got really stoked on on the idea of working in industry in my in my PhD. I got to my postdoc, and I struggled to find a postdoc. I could you know I, I wrote to like I like all the all the big names in my field, and I and I was like, oh sir, can I you know could I come please you know work in your lab, um, and uh, and I you know I, I if I could get a reply, it was like I'm you know I, I don't have space, uh, so I really struggled. And then my my um, 
uh, the, the fellow in the fume hood next to me and uh, doing grad school, he had just landed a postdoctoral position at MIT. And, uh, and he said, you know what, you know what you can do, Tim, is um, if you if you look at an assistant professor, they'll read your resume. Like I was applying to all the big names, you know, that that and so, you know, they don't they like they're certainly not going to pay for you because they can just get people who come, you know, with their own funding. And so like beyond that, they're, they're probably not even going to read your resume because they have enough like friends, you know, this whole networking thing that like they have their like circle that they're just like calling like, hey, you got to hire, you know, Sally is, is the next the next top talent, bring her to your lab. So um, so anyways, I, I wasn't in that scenario. So I had to, you know, kind of cold call uh, people and this, like <laughs> I actually called and, and I would recommend that that's still a great skill today to like find people's phone number if you can and give them a phone call. It's kind of like a surprising experience, but I would say that getting me to this job here, that was important. And uh, and and just the number of people that I met on my journey to, to come to here uh, happened a lot from just calling people on the call on the phone and saying, hey, hey you don't know me, um, but maybe you, maybe you consider hiring me. Um, and I mean, you guys say it maybe a bit more eloquently than that, but, uh, <laughs> um, but um, Anyways, uh, so I applied to an assistant professor uh, because my, my friend had just landed a job at MIT after being through a similar experience where he couldn't get, you know, the big names to read his resume. And now, of course, he was one of the first postdocs in, in, who, in Mo Mobasagi's lab, who's now like one of the biggest names in, in our field. Uh, and then likewise, I, I followed in his, in his footsteps and, and that brought me to New York City uh, to work with Tristan Lambert. I was his first postdoc. Uh, and so we, we unpacked boxes together, uh, and, you know, we, like there was kind of nothing on the ground when I started with him and, and, and that experience has been so, uh, critical to what I'm doing now as, as in myself an assistant professor now where, you know, I try to learn about like, what does it take to build a lab and, and, and all that jazz. So, um, and, and so Tristan was like, you should go to academia because it's clear that you 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 have many ideas and and you know I, I feel like you know you 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 should really think about going to academia. And I was like, no man, I'm going to industry. It's it's you know I I really want to I want to work on 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 a problem that that is you know going to impact human health was really what was motivating me. Uh, and and you know like work life balance seemed nice. Certainly by the end of my postdoc, I was pretty. Uh, I was tired <laughs> and so I was like you know I, I hear that they work nine to five over there that sounds nice uh all, stock, with all stock of, options are a lot better in industry than they are at the university they're fine yeah they're good <laughs> so uh so yeah so um well, so, so, it's a dude in the film hood next to you gives you the tip you go it's a good move and mm -hmm. um and you do go to the industry and, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess uh, one of the things that stuck with me uh, from that experience was so I was at Columbia for eighteen months, which in my field is like maybe on the shorter end of doing a postdoc, but it's not atypical. Like in my field, we don't typically do postdocs for for more than three years, I guess. Um, but the folks that I met in that eighteen months have continually uh, been hugely important in my career, and, and so these are people who. I mean, you know, it's tricky these days with 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 the, all the lockdowns and social distancing. But you know, just people that you would, you know, have lunch with, but even even maybe not even, even just more acquaintances. You know, that like we would run into each other in the NMR lab. And the number of times that I've crossed paths with with people from this circle uh, over over the ensuing fifteen or twenty years uh, is pretty incre incredible. Um, and um, uh, so I think that, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, you never ever know uh, who who it is that's sitting next to you that uh, that is going to be very important for your career later. Um, and so uh, and, and I've helped them out too many times. Right. Like they've helped me many times and 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 probably like two or three times a year. I get a call from one of my old uh, acquaintances or friends from those days and like, hey, you know, I'm 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 looking to move. I'm looking to make a move in my career. You know, do you know of any any opportunities? And and actually, a couple of times I, I have been able to to uh, connect them. So networking so, is big and, and some random bumping in. You never know who you're going to talk to. I've kind of already got this from you like three or four times, and we've only been in this for a few minutes. So yeah. it's it's interesting. So you go to you're, you're in industry. You're working on projects. You're I, I guess I want to do this for because we've got all level of students here, but uh, you. You're a synthetic chemist, so 
Mm -hmm. Give me a thumbnail. A synthetic chemist does what? Yeah, so a, uh, a synthetic chemist makes the molecules, right? So, so uh, let's, if, if we're okay, if we just talk about small molecules, so I don't want to talk about uh, vaccines or, or, um, or antibodies or... Um, right, the big proteins. Yeah. Uh, but if you understand, you know, kind of like that medicines that are pills are typically small molecules, then, uh, then someone's got to make that, right? Uh, so someone has to like synthesize that, put the pieces together because it, it's a very special molecule, right? It's a very, it's a very carefully designed product. And, and I talk with my students a lot about this, that, you know, that how a medicine or, or a, a drug is, is like, uh, a, I like to make the analogy to the iPhone that there's, you know, there's a team of people who have, have baked all these properties into the phone, right? So there's, you know, it's got like a battery life and a screen brightness and, and an operating system. And there's like a team that works on each part of that. But then for, for a drug, right? You want a drug that you take as a pill and it dissolves in your tummy and it gets across your organic uh, layer of your intestinal barrier and into your blood and it finds, let's say the brain. And then it, you know, it, it finds the, the target of Alzheimer's there in the brain and, and treats it. And so that's a very sophisticated product, right? That's a very sophisticated molecule that can do all of those things. And, and so there's a team of people that would focus on the solubility part of things. There's a team of people that would focus on the, you know, getting into the blood part of things and, and making sure that, you know, we can have a once, once daily pill. Um, and so uh, as a synthetic chemist, I'm the guy that helps to make that thing, right? So, so collectively, we all talk about, okay, what, what do our patients need? Right, and then once we understand what what it is that the patients need, then we then we have kind of a, a rough outline of what our product should look like, and then we start talking about okay, you know, are we talking about a once once daily pill? We're we talking about something that's inhaled, um, and when we understand that, then we can start to distill it down to the um, to the molecular level. So what you know, what is it about a molecule that might make it a better inhaled drug versus a better uh, oral drug? Uh, and, and you get to the molecular level and then you've got it kind of designed and then an architect has to kind of come in and say, okay, I, you know, I could take, I can, I can build you exactly that molecule by, uh, by breaking this bond and, and bringing in these Lego pieces over here and clicking it together. And you get, you know, you got like the, the piece that like makes it soluble, the piece that like helps it get to the brain, the piece that, you know, helps it get across the, the uh, blood brain barrier, all these little bits that got baked into your molecule, the same way as the Apple engineers put together the pieces of the right. So you you uh, you're sort of a good blend between medchem and pharmacy actually because some of that is pharmacy some of that's medchem but uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about today was uh, what you just described on steroids which was your recent uh, paper that made all the news about making the, making sure the supply chain for COVID uh, could be filled based on how we make these molecules can you give us sort of the two minute version of this uh, for the audience members who who haven't read that paper. I'll do my best. And if you don't get it here, you can listen to it on a, a science podcast. In, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. But uh, so um, uh, we make molecules, right? So, so the drugs are molecules. Someone's got to make them. And it's not easy, right? Obviously, it's not easy. Drugs are expensive. And, uh, and think of all the data inputs that come into this. So there's like everything I just described, right? So there's like solubility, there's getting to the brain, there's all the pieces that go to that. Um, and then, then for me, the person who focuses on how to make that, there's this huge extra layer of data of like, what are the catalysts that allow me to make this bond, you know? And what are the, uh, what are the, you know, kind of like the recipe of like, I mean, it is like, you know, oil of newt and like bat wing and, and you know, putting that into, whatever and shooting flames at it is roughly well, there's a lot of there's a lot of raw materials and i know we're having trouble with raw materials and especially with the international trade the way it is right 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 so so what bruce knows the punchline and i, I really struggle to get the punchline uh so um so uh so there's there's all this data input there's more data than the human brain can handle so we need artificial intelligence is the point. so we need artificial intelligence to take all of this data and bake it down into a recipe that we can make the drugs so there's recipes for making drugs, and then there's going to be drugs for COVID. And as you just saw, we ran out of macaroni and cheese. We ran out of toilet paper. We ran out of hand sanitizer. We're going to run out of these high-tech products. We are going to run out of these drugs. Or I don't know, maybe things are seemingly loosening a little bit. But when we started, had this discussion, it was in March and April. And it was like, yeah, man, if we're going to run out of everything. We're going to run out of these drugs. The recipes that exist for making these molecules 
uh, won't satisfy the global demand of the millions of doses we're going to need. So we need new ways to make them. Now, I told you there's all this data that goes into making them, and now we needed to make them differently. We couldn't use the existing supply chain. We needed to make a new supply chain to them. So we used artificial intelligence uh, to do that. Uh, we did it 12 times over for 12 different drugs that are in the clinic right now. Uh, and, and found we found commercial, uh, sorry, we found routes to these molecules, synthetic routes that are shorter in many cases than the commercial routes. So should we run out of, of them because, because COVID is, uh, is, is you know, uh, sealing up that supply. Uh, we've provided a framework so that pharma companies can make, make you know, backup supplies and, and hopefully, you know, hopefully help some people that, that are in need. Yeah, because once it hits, you know, we did, especially in March and April, we didn't know if remdesivir was going to be great or if we, everyone was going to need hydroxychloroquine or whatever. So your paper was just neat because drug shortages are such a big thing that we have a full-time army of pharmacists at the hospital just trying to, to go through those very processes. Uh, and so your research along as I really sort of hit the, the pharmacist uh, in, in my head about that this is something that's really important because there's nothing worse than knowing that you got a drug that works, but they can't make it anymore because oh, wherever. It used to be we couldn't get IVs because a hurricane hit Puerto Rico and wiped out that manufacturing plant, but, but the lack of raw materials and, and all these other things are, are really important. Now, I'm assuming none of that has to do with a $1 robot. No. Oh, snap. The $1 robot story. Okay. But I really want to try to answer Aaron Johnson's question. Yeah, I want to get Aaron's. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's go there then. Uh, the, the question uh, that Aaron asked uh, is uh, you work in the industry, and, but you're not a pharmacist. Uh, mm -hmm. And you bring, you bring a chemist perspective to industry. Did, was there times when you interfaced with pharmacists and you, you bring different things to the table? What, what were those different things? What value does yeah. a pharmacist bring to industry? Well, I mean, I, I think that the, uh, the, the farm bees uh, that I've interacted with have been at a much higher level, right? So, the, so the, they, I mean, these guys are like, I, I've met, I've met uh, men and women with, with a farm bee background who are uh, helping drugs get through the clinic. And so, I mean, that's a huge thing. And, and like, you know, that, like, if, if, if uh, those who have taken my class, you know, I, I really stress, like, you don't want to screw this up, right? Because, like, once we get into the clinic, we've made billions of dollars in investment, like, that, like, navigating that, uh, that pathway of, of, you know, so who needs, who needs to know about this? Like, who, like, what are the regulatory agencies that need to think about this? Who's going to pay for this product, right? That's a huge part of the problem is, like, will insurers pay for this? Will, you know, will Blue Cross Blue Shield pay for a product, because if you if the patient alone has to pay for it, it that's not a really a good product. You know, so and Blue Cross Blue Shield is trying to do all the math. Um, so I think that in in the most part, the uh, the farm bees I've interacted with have been um, have been I, I've met a lot of farm bees at the executive level uh, who are engaged in in navigating through the clinic and helping to make sure that those clinical trials are are properly set up. Uh, and you know, I mean, and and, and connecting to all these different uh, players in the field, the scientists, the marketing, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the regulatory agencies and, and the payers uh, to, to try and you know, get this drug to the market. Um, all right, so my, uh, my, my, my story about the robot is, uh, is I, was, uh, I went to Merck, I guess we didn't talk about that. So it turns out I, I went to industry is what was kind of like a part of this too. And uh, so I spent nine years in industry uh, um, loved it, loved it, loved it. I still totally love it. I have a lot of engagement with industry. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people always ask, why did you, you know, why, why, why did you leave industry? And I don't know, it was a midlife crisis. I, took, I could have taken up hand clipping, I guess, but um, it, I, I, um, I, I, I really, no, I mean, I had, I had too many ideas and I was basically running an academic lab and I wanted to get back to things like Chardonnay wines that I could not do in the pharmaceutical. Department. We're going to come back to that too, by the way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I told you how I'm using AI now, uh, in those days and definitely here in my labs here, we, we, we use a lot of robotics and, um, and, uh, so robotics kind of like, like set us up to get, to generate all this data. This is the research that I've done over the past 10 years. Uh, and, and, you know, we use robots to generate lots of data and then we feed that data into AI to try and answer new problems. Like how could we solve the supply chain crisis or COVID? So I loved robots. I was doing robotic research at Merck. I wanted to come to academia. I was, I mean, my, my, you know, this was very much a romantic endeavor. I wanted to, uh, I was ready to do this with a chalkboard and a piece of chalk and just like write out theories and, and that would have been fully satisfying to me. But 
but at the same time, it would have been cool to run like a high powered lab with robots. But I, I knew I couldn't afford robots. So, um, but we had a robot in the lab that I ran at Merck and I was the guy that was running it and, uh, and I was leaving. So, so I started to like kind of spread word that, you know, nobody knows how to use this thing. No one's going to use it. It's going to be a safety hazard. You guys, you don't, you don't have any space. Um, and, uh, so you got to get rid of this thing. And, you know, I got like general agreement from management, like, yeah, you, you're right. You should have it. Uh, but I mean, big companies, they don't donate easily to like, I mean, it's not easy for them to give something to, right. to there's, there's a lot of red tape around that. And I guess we don't have time to unpack that. But, um, anyways, I asked, you know, I asked, I asked my boss, he's like, uh, yeah, I, you can have it, but I don't know how you get it. I asked his boss. He's like, yeah, you, I don't know. How to, I didn't ask his boss. And she was like, you know, I don't know. So finally, like it, it, in, in our corporate structure, you could click in the email to find out whose boss's 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 boss was there was. So I kept going up and I had like three days left at Merck. And I was like, it's got to happen now. So I'll just go all the way to the top, the highest person I can find. And, uh, and then I, um, I, I, um, I uh, went and uh, knocked on his door because he turned out to be in the same building I was in. And, uh, and I, I hadn't met him before. And I said, uh, sir, um, I, uh, I, I have a story I want to uh, tell you. Uh, I've been using a robot in this building for some time, and I'd really like to have it. Uh, Aaron asked, was it the CEO? No, he was not the CEO. He was like a head of facilities. Um, but I'm like, you know, I, I really want this thing. Uh, and I just, you know, here's my story. And, and I look up, and behind his desk is, a, is, the, is the big maize and blue M. And like, oh. um, so so here, here's my story. And, uh, and go blue. And he's like, Ar he, he's like, he's like, let me make some calls. You'll get your robot. Um, and then, uh, and then, then at, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Michigan made it very difficult. Michigan would not receive the robot as a donation. Because That's our paperwork. Yeah. But, but you know what? The, the networking really matters, right? It just really does matter. All right. We got a bunch of so audience then, questions coming in too. Go ahead. Finish it. You, you have the robot? I have the robot. Because they put it on eBay for five minutes for one dollar, so that, and they told me it's going to go up, and uh, and I bought it, um, and that's how we got around Michigan red tape, and that's how we got around, you know, the, uh, and all of it, all of it required just the bravery of picking up the phone, of talking to people, and saying, you know, um, hey, like, what have I got to lose, right? Like, I mean, like, I could walk out of this room with egg on my face, but um, I walked out with a robot. Maze M saved you there. That's great. All right, we got some student questions coming in. One of them says, uh, one's from a PharmD student who wants to know, can you talk a little bit more about the kind of research a PharmD might do in research versus a PhD? Is it pigeonholed? That you, you, is it degreeist? Or, or is there a certain kind of research you see PharmDs tend to get more in industry? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the PharmD uh, research track has, has a lot more to do with the actual, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical aspect of it, right? That uh, that um, there, there's so much more to uh, to it than the molecular level uh, to to getting at these drugs. And and my, the students who took my exam yesterday are not not pleased to hear that because I, I really drilled them at the at the atomic level. Um, but you know, I mean, my um, my uh, you know my expertise coming in, I knew nothing about drug discovery when I came into the industry, like absolutely nothing. And, and I, I was really, really good at making molecules. And, uh, and, and that's what companies, you know, for the role I was filling, that's what they wanted. They wanted, uh, they wanted people who did that one thing. And then once I got in, I mean, a company that's going to invent one of these super sophisticated products needs to have uh, all of these different diversity of, of skills and people within their workforce. And so people who understand like what a drug is, they need to teach people like me when I was, you know, when I was just entering the industry is like, I can make the molecule for you, but I don't know what this molecule should look like. Like, I don't know, I don't know what it should do. Um, and uh, like, I, you know, I spent the, the, the years prior, like making, uh, making stuff with palladium because palladium was super cool. And then, and then making stuff that came out of some obscure marine sponge because it had a neat structure. Like you know, that, that's what I, did. I was good at doing stuff like that, but then, that's not what a drug is, right? So, so we need people who understand what a drug is. Say, you know, do you like? Do you wonder, are you thinking about the pharmacokinetics of this? Uh, are you thinking about the, you know, the, the formulation that that might be the best one to use? 
Um, and so, so I think that in a research uh, role, there's, there's probably a, a lot of room there uh, to, uh, to, you know, to kind of tie together the, the application aspect of, you know, for, for me as an organic, like I was, I'd studied as an organic chemist and I needed to learn how to apply my organic chemistry skills. And I think that the PharmD uh, track probably treats you, uh, helps you understand much better about the application of these molecules. Yeah, I, I agree. You can speak more like, in pharmacy, you, you, you're trained unlike anybody else. You can speak a little pharmacokinetics, you can speak a little regulatory, but you can speak clinical and you're the only group you know medicine doesn't have that nobody else has got that sphere and you can speak in a lot of different world in a lot of different meetings with different people and and be, understand what you're talking about all right another question just came in uh, i love this question you've gone through so many positions in your career uh want to understand how you seem to know when to take the leap to the next position which opportunities should you grab even if you might be uninterested like weighing rocks but you did it anyway like how did you develop this internal compass to knowing when to leap to take something, a new challenge. Right, <laughs> asked by my boss. Um, <laughs> As if you knew what you're doing at the time, maybe it might be the fair thing, but. Yeah. You know, like this is one of the things I love about my about my current role is that like, I never know what's coming, you know, like two hours down the road. I, I don't know what's, what's waiting for me. And so um, it, like at a certain point, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, if, if you feel like for me, if I feel like I've run out of challenges, then uh, then 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 at one point, it, like then, um, it, 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 I, I need new challenges, and I need you know I need um, I, I I need uh, I need to always be thinking about you know different things, um, and so uh, so for me, you know, I think that uh, I, I think that uh, yeah, I, I think that I've always just you know like. If, if I, I, I never got too comfortable, really, uh, is, is, is what I would say. Um, and then um, in terms of like, you know, there was, a, there was like a nuance to that that was like, how do you like, you know, how do you know to take the leap or something? And I, 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 I try not to overthink things. And I think at, you know, I, at this point, I, I just turned 40. So I'm like, um, now I, with 40 years of life experience, I've learned that like, setting up expectations is, is kind of a fool's errand for me anyways. I mean, just like, you know, writing everything down in a list of like, here's what I want it to look like. Um, it, you know, it, like, I think it's really good to plan things out, but I think that, uh, you know, then, then, then the earth throws you a COVID pandemic and you're like, all right, well, I'll pivot from everything I had written down on that list and, and I'll adjust. And, um, and so, um, you know, really, I think what it came down to, it, it was just the culture of the places that I was visiting. I mean, the, the weighing rocks aside, weighing rocks was desperation because I was young and I didn't know anything else to do, right? I, I was like, there's one job. I'll take that one job. Um, and, um, but, um, but uh, uh, one, then that taught me, right? I think every one of these things, has, every one of my experiences has taught me something about life and that taught me, I don't want to weigh rocks. I want you know, I, I need to do something that's more creative. Um, and so then I, then I, I, I took control of that. And then I, then I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to find a research opportunity because that's what I need to do. Um, and it, but it, I think in every, every aspect, you know, that like when, when I visited a company and had an opportunity, uh, like I've, I've had, uh, you know, offers from, from different industry, uh, positions and offers from different, uh, schools when I was interviewing for this job. And, and so ultimately it was like, well, why did I pick this one? And I think that, you know, you, you really have to ask yourself, like, would I enjoy doing that? And and you, you, it has to be for you, right? I mean, like if you did any amount of like, you know, that like you felt like it was, you know, other people wanted you to do it or, or but if you didn't feel like you like, cause I mean, that's gonna be your job, right? And you have to be like, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna jump out of bed in the morning to go and do this. And that has to come from you. That can't really come from anyone else. So I think that, you know, having the, having the culture around you where you can see like, I, I would be so excited to do that um it is kind of been helpful for me or you know it's been obvious i think when when i when i've seen it like if i feel like if you're kind of on the fence it's and that's probably not the best role to take unless it's the only one you've got and then 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 you know that's where you should start and then grow from there 
All right. Well, we need to wrap this up so that everybody can get to their MedCam study groups. Uh, it sounds like with the way you're building molecules, were you a kid who just had a million Legos or Lincoln Logs or something? You had to have been. It's just I can't see it any other way. That had to be yeah. you. My, my mom was a secretary in a hospital. And uh, and so when I'd go pick her up from work with my dad, uh, we saw all like the lab wear. And, and so the doctor was like, oh, look at this kid. He loves it. And I had the best chemistry set on my block. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before I, my last question to you is, you, I can't let you leave without giving us at least one Chardonnay wine tip of a wine that we can afford that you think we should try that you think is a good one, good quality to price ratio uh, for. To, oh yeah, we need something to stay hydrated during our medchem studying. Oh, I well, I mean, I, I mean, anything from Burgundy, really, um, like uh, a Macon Village that, you know, that, I mean, like, you know, you can get one of those for like 17 bucks or something. Okay, um, okay. wow, you got expensive. I mean, you forgot that these are pharmacy students. Wow. Well, all I right. Mean, I, I mean, the, the one with the yellow kangaroo, that's, that, that's <laughs> that, I don't know. Anyway. All right, we're going to go to Burgundy then. That's it. Well, I really appreciate you being uh, the guest uh, on the program here. It's, it's been a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Uh, and, uh, I really thank you for coming out of the program. This was, this was great. We talked about things I never thought we were going to be talking about, to be honest with you. And I want to tell the audience, uh, to be ready for our next webinar. It's going to be our newest faculty member, Dr. Hannah Fan, who is, uh, a person who graduated from Michigan, went away for a lot of years and just came back. And what's really interesting about, uh, Hannah is that she might be the world's most foremost PharmD, pharmacist type person doing research in cystic fibrosis, something we don't cover very much in our curriculum uh, that affects a whole lot of people. And uh, I'm really excited to have her on the show. So, so stay tuned for next Thursday, October 8th, 530, same time. We'll send you the link. And Tim, thanks again for coming on to the program. We had a great Thanks, time. Thank you. Thank you.